lovely, mm. lovely Sunday morning. I'm enjoying the day so far. Um, I have several announcements. We'll just plow through them real quick. Um, the mission collection for August is going to the Trumbull County Children's Services. We're asking for donations of elastic waist shorts, size 2T to large, for boys or girls. A ministry team meeting, so if you are a ministry team leader or chair of a committee, um, the meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, August 16th at 7. Uh, we will distribute calendars and make everything sync up and get ready for the coming quarter. Um, Chancel Choir kickoff potluck. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Chancel Choir will kick off their um, their season on Saturday, August 27th at 6 in the Church Fellowship Hall. Drinks and place settings will be provided. This week I've got trustees, no, trustees canceled, no, finance canceled. So it's trustee meeting. And then um, Wednesday is elders. And Thursday is newsletter day. So if you have something you want in the newsletter, it needs to be to care by Thursday morning. Alrighty? If you are a visitor or if you've not yet filled out one of our Connect cards, we encourage you to do so and put them in the offering plate on your way out. This is how we keep in touch with you. We are, uh, we've been revamping our databases all summer and you'd be amazed at all the changes we've made. We've had your wrong addresses, your wrong phone numbers, all of that. So this is, uh, we really want to have the right things and we're not just going to hand it out. Um, but it's important for the church to know how to, where to send you stuff. So if you haven't done that, please do so. And if you have a particular prayer concern, there's spaces for those on the back. Let us worship. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Come, children of God, rejoice in your maker. Sing songs and hymns, old and new. Celebrate with voices and instruments, with praise and prayers. Open your eyes to the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ. For God is already here, among us and within us, bringing new life to all who believe. Let, Let us praise, praise God, God together. Please pray with me. O oh God of mystery and surprise, as Christ journeyed with the two who traveled the Emmaus Road, travel with us on our journey of faith. In our encounters on the way, give us compassion to listen to the other's story, patience to explain what may seem obvious to ourselves, and courage to make our souls vulnerable so that others may encounter you through us, and we may rediscover you through them. Together we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. Stand as you are able and join me in this morning's opening hymn.
every week as we gather, the most, one of the most important things we do as the body of Christ is pray for and with each other. And so we spend this time in prayer holding each other. We share those things we are celebrating as well as those things which lie heavy on our hearts. And is in the sharing that our bonds are made stronger, that our burdens are made lighter, that our joys are made greater. We have a few things to, um, to continue to keep in our prayers. Um, continue to pray, uh, pray for Dave, for Dave O'Rell, who is having surgery on Tuesday, for Chuck Stein, who um, is having back, a back procedure. Um, tomorrow, and um, continue to prayer, pray for Cindy and Jerry, Simba's um, son-in-law. All right? I appreciate that. I'm going to invite you into a time of silence and meditation. Allow you to get comfortable, take a breath if you like, unhinge your jaw, lower your shoulders. Our softened bodies, I create softened hearts, open minds. Let's sit in silence for a bit to invite the Holy Spirit. Will you join me? O oh Christ, as we enjoy your company, we remember that there are many people who are alone or rejected. We think of those who are, whose aging, illness, or family circumstances mean that they feel as though no one is truly with them. May we see more clearly where they are, O oh Christ, and be loyal friends to them. <laughs> If they are isolated because of any form of prejudice, looking longly at the lives of those who have company and communities of support, show us the beauty of all humanness, O oh God, and call us to draw near in love. Give us your people, give, give to us your people the courage and authenticity to share the questions we have about faith and life, Help us to create an environment where honesty is possible so that we genuinely discuss the tougher issues together. Then when we hold in our hands the bread and wine, may we recognize the wonder of the gift which lies there and receive it in truth as your life with us. Amen. I'm going to invite you to do something this morning before I read. I want you, if you were a kid that grew up in church, I want you to think about what was the first picture of Jesus that you had? What was, or what was the first time that you saw a picture and knew who that guy was? on to that. 
Our scripture today comes from the book of Luke, chapter 24, 13 to 35. It's a bit of a chunk. Let's settle in. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. And while they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. And then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophet talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things, then enter in his glory? And then he interpreted for them the things written about himself in all the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. And when they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he were going on ahead, but they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And after he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Simon. And then the two disciples described what had happened along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. I love Luke. I think he's the best storyteller out of all four Gospels. And Emmaus is one of my favorite stories. I love the way that he builds it, right? You start, they're walking along the road, they walk for a while, and you get a sense of the link that's going on. Jesus starts at Moses and talks all the way through the prophets. You feel like you're walking with them and they invite him in for dinner, and you sit down, and somehow it feels like maybe you're on a roller coaster, like maybe you just hit the top of the hill, right? And all of a sudden, Luke does this thing, right? They sit to eat, Jesus breaks the bread, and all, and the scales fall from their eyes. Jesus is known at the table in the breaking of the bread. They didn't recognize him. They didn't know who he was. Out of context, <clears throat> away from Jerusalem, maybe in a different guise, as it was a resurrection appearance, somehow they missed, they missed Jesus. I don't know if any of you have ever been like this. I always feel guilty. If I'm at a coffee shop or the grocery store or what have you, and I run across someone from my church or an old or an old 
students or something. Sometimes, sometimes when you don't, when you only see people in one context, and then you see them in a completely different place where you're not expecting them, you you have to do an adjust, right? Like you have to go, wait a minute. You have to check it. It's kind of like being 10 and your second grade teacher is at the grocery store buying buying vegetables and you're really confused because as far as you're concerned, your second grade teacher never leaves her classroom. Right? It's like that. And Luke has built this effect. He's inched us up the hill. We've hit the top. And down we come. I love that feeling. And for me, when I begin to think of what is my most held thing, what is the core of my faith, it's that Jesus shows up in places I don't expect, in guises I wouldn't have imagined. And sometimes I only figure it out weeks, months, years later. You ever had that experience? It's only in hindsight that you recognize, oh, Jesus was here. And so, I got to thinking about this, and let's just be clear that I'm a nerd, right? I'm a total nerd about stuff, and I'm a bit of a history nerd, and one of the things that I love about uh, religion, and especially American Christianity, is that we create stuff, right? You can, there's whole branches of history you can tell the story of American Christianity through journals and Sunday school leaflets. Through artwork and um, lately YouTube. You'd be surprised what kind of videos and cartoons and stuff you can find online. Maybe you wouldn't be, but some days I am. We create stuff and stuff has a way of forming what we think and who we are because it's part of our cultural context, right? If you, if I were to walk into one of you all's homes and look around the family room, I wonder what I might learn about you. Perhaps you've got an entire wall covered with grandchildren I'm going to learn that you have many and that they are well loved. Or perhaps you have an art collection of a particular artist. Or you like rabbits, and so you've got pictures of rabbits up. I don't know, but there's something to learn about us when you look at what's around us. Does that make sense? About the, sometimes the things we own, who we are. And Christianity does that, and I'm a nerd. So, when I started looking, the next, uh, thinking about that, I wanted, I wanted to talk about the next three Sundays about all the different ways that we see Jesus and that we offer the world materially. Karen, you wanna go ahead and switch? I asked you to think about who Jesus was when you were a kid. If you were around, how you knew who that was. We see, I just grabbed, these are, this is clip art that I just grabbed off the, off the web. Um, sort of a realistic cartoon. You've got uh, color pages. I don't know if anybody else grew up in the age of color page leaflets, but my Sunday school leaflets always had a color page in them. Um, there's a ginger Jesus. That's a very serious Jesus. Now we always seem to know because he has the red thing, but there's a very serious Jesus. There's Jesus. He's got a loaf and a, he's got some bread and fish. And he's, so we know what story that is at least. We get it. He's got the bread and the fish. That makes him Jesus. There's the story of Lazarus up there. He's walking on the water up here. Next one, Karen, please. Yeah, next one. Can we 
Oh, there we go. Excellent. Um, I'm going to work this way. I don't know if many of you have seen these. These things are incredibly expensive, but they're Fisher Price Little People Nativity sets. They run like $150. It's insane. But they're the most adorable things I've ever seen. And they look like the little people I grew up with, right? They're short and squat, and they have cherub cheeks. And if you push the angel and the star, it makes a sound, which seems, which reminds me of the little people barn I had. You open the door and it goes, right? So it looks like stuff I already have. Already, I'm sort of figuring out. That's how it makes me comfortable. This. These are plush Jesus toys. Everybody has plushies. It's easy. We understand plushies. We understand stuffed animals. So, ta-da. And sometimes they come with a Jesus storybook or something. In all kinds of different ways out there. But we get it. We see a red sash, a blue sash, a beard, the hair. That's Jesus. Betty Lukens. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this. In the 80s, this was a big thing in Sunday school circles. It started out in the uh, um, Seventh-day Adventist church, but quickly spread. And it's actually still used by missionaries today when they teach children Bible stories. And that picture, right, there's, it's a felt board, I don't, and it lays out. And then it, there are like 600 little felt figures, and you move them around and tell the stories. And there you go. You always know that that's Jesus, because Jesus always has on a white robe and, and brown hair. And that's how you know. All right, next. This is um, the children's worship. I, I was trained to teach when I was in seminary. This is called Young Children in Worship. It's based on a Montessori model. So the children play. So you t again, it's sort of kinesthetic, right? You tell the stories with these blank wooden figures. There's no faces. There's no painted outfits. But you always know Jesus because Jesus is always doing this. It doesn't matter what story he's in. This is what Jesus does. And... When you're finished telling the story, the kids play the story and tell it back to you, and it's a lot of fun. And so you can see Jesus and the children. Um, this is the road to Emmaus here, the story that we just heard. So as children, we have an idea, right? We figure out who it is. We can point at that guy and say, hey, that's Jesus. And he's a friend. He's comfortable because he looks like our other cartoons, right? He... He follows conventions. He smiles, there's pastel colors. We get it. All right, next slide. And then we grow up. And we discover that for all kinds of people, Jesus happens in all kinds of ways. Um, this artist is He Chi. He lives in Minneapolis, but he's Chinese. Um, his art ha um, embraces a lot of adult ca Christian calendars and still Sunday school leaflets and stuff like bulletin covers, all kinds of stuff like that. And you can see here the road to Emmaus, the two people walking along. And we know Jesus because we've got the red slash there. And here he is breaking the bread. We've got the fish there. We've got the wine the two people, and there's Jesus. We know because of the halo, breaking the bread. Does that look like any Jesus you've ever seen? It's a different, it's a different view, isn't it? Kind of the kaleidoscope changes a little. Okay, Miss Karen. Here are a few others that I just, that once again I've just kind of grabbed. Um, Christ at Emmaus, here on the right, in red. That's Sadeo Watanabe, he was a Japanese artist. You know Jesus, of course, because he's the one in the middle. Also, he's got a blessing hand up. If you've ever, you know, 
gone into older church, Catholic churches or cathedrals or seen Greek icons, you know, Jesus is always like, Jesus is always blessing folks, right? So he's got his hand up. So that's, that's the, the fish and the candles. Here is an interesting one that I still don't completely understand, but I thought it was kind of fascinating. This is Ivo Saliger. He was um, a Czech German artist uh, through the 30s and 40s. And this is his table of Emmaus. He's brought Jesus forward to these, these you know, folks who, these men who look very of their time, and then you have Jesus. His halo, his robe, he's holding a piece of bread. <coughs> it almost looks like they're interrogating him the way the light hits him, right? It's a different view. He looks older in that one, I think, up close. He looks like much older than our cartoons, even. All right, next slide, please. Road to Emmaus, Warner Salmon. This is so, in, this is where I get a little like, this is where my little nerd, nerd heart beats faster. Warner Salmon was um, an American artist, um, advertising artist. He was a commercial artist. Um, and he was free, worked freelance often for different Christian publications. We'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about that, but this is his walk to Emmaus. What I think is interesting is the people may be at the center, but they're certainly not the focus, it seems, right? They seem really far off. I don't know how you recognize who's who when they're so far off. But I love the colors in the mountains. It makes it look like a pleasant afternoon stroll, doesn't it? Don't you want to go walk through that? It's almost Eden-like. The pastels. I really love that. All right, next slide. Warner Salmon. He, so he is this Chicago artist. I want to make sure I have my dates correct. Not so, but always so great at that. So, in the, there we go. Um, he was a member of the Evangelical Covenant Church, which was Swedish Finnish extraction. He lived in Chicago. And in the tw 1924, he was asked by his church's publishing company to illustrate their monthly Sunday school leaflet. Perhaps you, maybe, I know none of you may remember 1924, but perhaps in, le in your youth years you had leaflets like this. And so he tells, the, the way he tells the story in documentaries and interviews is he's been asked to do a, a picture, an illustration for the Covenant Companion, which is the youth magazine. And he, he's blocked. He doesn't know what he wants to do. He can't figure it out. So the night before it's due, he finally gives up. He goes to bed. He wakes up at like 3 a.m. And it's there. It's in his head. He knows exactly what he wants. He knows exactly what he's supposed to do. He gets up and he draws that. And that... His, his name for that is Son of Man. So, and it's a charcoal, a pencil sketch, right? And so this is 1924. Eventually, the same people who saw that, um, some other publishers come along too and say, that is gold. There's something about that picture. There's something about that. And they get him to, in 1940, get him to paint an oil picture of it. And it becomes really popular. The, and, it, and it becomes very, very commercial. It's on clocks. 
it's it's in the front page of Bibles. It's yeah. I mean, there are a thousand. The if you go through their catalog, there's a thousand and one thing things like materials that that picture shows up on. It's kind of like Mickey, right? Like there isn't anything that Mickey Mouse hasn't graced. So there you go. And he would he got hired by the Covenant Church. And he would go around the country to different churches, give his testimony, and then while, while the choir sang or a musician played, he would do what he called a chalk talk. He would create, there on the spot, that picture. It grew so much in popularity, primarily because the Salvation Army and the YMCA put it on a wallet size card. The picture on the front, the Lord's Prayer on the back. And they handed it out to soldiers heading off to World War II. It is the most produced picture of Jesus ever. Something like 500 billion prints have been out in various, in all kinds of ways. Go ahead to the next one, please. Solomon becomes prolific, right? He becomes the person to be known. So he not only is the head of Christ, his sort of signature work, but then he continues to work. You, there are two different museums, one of which is at Anderson University in Anderson, Indiana, and they, they have a bunch of his originals. Christ in Gethsemane, Christ our pilot. I always thought that was interesting. Have you seen that one before? The Good Shepherd. Christ at Heart's Door. And of course the Head of Christ. His representation, there's something about it that looks familiar, right? It feels comforting and people take comfort from it. And there are a number of reasons why. And everybody probably has their own, but Notice that it kind of looks like an old 30s Hollywood studio picture. The way it's lit. I mean, you could kind of like switch him out for Clark Gable and it might look sort of the same. Or it looks like if you look at old yearbooks of the 30s, 20s and 30s, it's a yearbook picture. So already, that's our, our in context, right? We're already open to accept that. He, that is how he looks. And of course, Solomon spends his life witnessing for Christ, sharing his art. He had a talent, a gift, and he used it to present Jesus in all kinds of ways. And of course, he had some pushback in various ways at various times, one of which was early on, uh, early 50s, suddenly this Jesus that looked so friendly and so loving 10 years ago in the early 50s or late, maybe even into the 60s, begins to look, well, too feminine. He's too soft. It's one of the critiques that gets lobbied at that. So there are other artists who have a crack at it. Warner himself try, tries it in 19, the, one of his last attempts, he tries to sort of modernize it in the late 60s. And basically what he does is he puts it straight on. All right. Here is another interesting story. You, know, you notice I really like the stories that are attached to how this happens. This is called The Life of Jesus Mamba. In the 70s, you have a French priest who goes to Cameroon, which of course had been um, colonized by the French. So he's a French Catholic priest who goes to Cameroon. He's among the Mamba tribe. And he is, of course, proselytizing and trying to teach the stories of the Bible. 
And so it becomes this really sort of very modern project. They dress up and act out the stories. Not any different than any other Sunday school or Christmas pageant, right? They dress up and act out the stories and then someone is taking pictures while they do it and then another artist takes the pictures and turns them to pastels and oils. And suddenly, there is a whole life of Jesus to be shared among these people. A life of Jesus that tells the story and that mirrors their context. We see Jesus in the red there, and instead of red, he has rice. And there's the two that he walked with, and there are families in the background, and a, a sort of an Amatha household. Next one. Here's some other transformative stories that they tell, the transfiguration. We see Jesus there with Elijah and Moses. Here we have Jesus and John the Baptist. Do you see how they're making Jesus their own? It doesn't look like a Jesus you or I might recognize. But it is who Jesus is for these particular people in their particular context. The Lord's Supper, I love this one too. It's got a big bowl of rice or stew or whatever he's, he's sharing. So it's not a loaf of bread as we in the West might traditionally know it. It's different, right? And there he is in his bread with his bowl. They're seated at a low table, uh, everyone sort of bending over, and there he is in the middle. Crucifixion. We have the women at the feet of the cross, foot of the cross, quite literally. I know maybe that's Peter or, the, or John or the disciple that Jesus loved. But there he is. I love the headscarves that the women are wearing. Next. Oh my goodness. So in 2001, there was a BBC documentary um, that then ran on the Discovery Channel over here a little later. Um, in the US, it was called never um, Jesus, the Complete Story. And basically what they did was they did a very scientific look at the story of Jesus. And various Bible scholars and anthropologists and first century historians all kind of weighed in and talked about that. But the highlight of the entire thing, the thing that ended up on the cover of Time magazine, was this. Richard Neaver is a forensic anthropologist, a uh, medical artist. He took um, three first century Palestinian skulls from the Department of Archaeology at, a, at an Israeli university and created in clay and then on, in a 3D picture what a first century Palestinian might look like. Nobody claimed this was Jesus, you understand. Instead it was this, this might, this is what we think a first century Palestinian Jew might look like. It's a long way from Warner Solomon, isn't it? And in evangelical circles in the US, it caused some, some backlash. But once again, no one's saying this is Jesus, simply that this is what a first century Palestinian Jew would look like. There's a Dutch artist, Boz, and I'm not going to try his last name, who does um, computer art, artificial intelligence art. And so he takes um, pictures, sculptures, whatever, and turns it into very realistic portraits. And so he took this this Galilean model, 
and turned it into that. And all along the way, when we look at all the different kinds of Jesus pictures and photos and cartoons and all of it, all along the way, we notice that it's culture and context, the kind of shapes that physical likeness, right? If, you, if you've traveled abroad and you've been to old cathedrals, old Catholic churches, Lutheran Episcopalian churches, and you'd see the arch on the wall, if you go to a Greek Orthodox church with its icons, you're, you're going to see every particular kind of figure. It's going to cue you in, just like how we would see G Superman evolve over the ages. Not comparing Jesus to Superman, you understand, just the context of it. And it gets me thinking, what? Not only does Jesus show up in ways we don't understand, in guises we can't predict. But what does our Jesus say about how, who we are as Christians? I'm not so interested at this point. I want to move from the material to the spiritual. Who, what, does your Jesus say about who you are? How does that particular image of Jesus, be it physical or spiritual, shape what your faith is? How do some of your early material Jesus images, how did they affect your faith going forward? How does something change what you think about Jesus? A different guise, a different way of thinking, a different angle. What does that look like? How does it change our testimony as Christians? It's a big question. And it also has to do with the identity of this particular place, this particular body of Christ. What do all of our, we are, <laughs> we are a people where every single one of us has a different thought, a different image. What does that, how do we get it all together, right? How do we share our Jesuses? Not to come to a consensus, maybe, but to understand that each of us is carrying a life and experiences that have shaped who we think Jesus is and how Jesus works and why church and Christianity works for us. Those are huge questions. I don't know, I'll live the rest of my life trying to figure them out and probably not coming anywhere close. But I invite you to mull that over this week as you think about that. And I can, I'm happy to um, send you links. I don't think we can put this, because of copyright stuff, I don't think we can put it up like on our Facebook page. But I'm always happy to send a presentation um, and my outline to people if they ask. So there's your challenge, my folks. Who is Jesus to you? What does Jesus look like in this place, in this context, in this time? And how are we going to articulate that? Amen. Our call to sharing this week, today, I want to celebrate 
our school supply handout. Hinks, he tells me that there, our final count was 105 families. Children. Children, 105 children that we served. It was supposed to start at nine. I, of course, rolled in about 9.15, and it was over. People were lined up, apparently, to the street beginning at who knows how early. Casey got here at 8.30, 8.15, and people were already lined up. This is money that you donated supplies that you donated. This is also representative of St. Williams, of Wildare, and of the local Campion Police had a fill the cruiser event outside of a big lots. So people bought school supplies, brought them out, and tried to figure out how much they could stuff into the police cruiser. It was insane. But it was ministry. And it was pretty darn amazing. Thank you. Let's bless that, shall we? Like the disciples at Emmaus, we offer what we have. They offered their company, their table, their bread. We invite you to be with us, Jesus, as we offer you our love, our devotion, these gifts. May our eyes be open to your holy presence among us, now and always. Amen. And now will you join me in our communion hymn, We Remember You. Set before us, we see the elements of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> the bread represents Christ's broken body to make us whole. The cup of juice represents Christ's blood given as payment for our sins. As we participate in the Lord's Supper, we are participating in some really profound symbolism. As we understand the teaching of the scripture, there is nothing magical happening to the elements, either as we pray or as we partake of them. They remain simply bread and juice, symbolic of Christ's blood. Yet there is something more. There is something more going on. Something very special. Because whenever we 
respond to the Lord Jesus in faith, he meets us with his grace. He gives us salvation for the lost, courage for the fearful, wisdom for the perplexed, rest for the weary, joy for the brokenhearted. We go on and on with those kinds of things. The bottom line is we need to respond. Jesus responds to us because of our faith. So as we eat the bread and drink the cup together in faith, we receive the grace to meet whatever is our truest need, both as individuals and as a body. So I ask you that you simplify that key. So I ask that you simply put everything else out of your minds and hearts for a few minutes and seek the Lord in faith, expecting that he will meet you where you need him. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I've been thinking of the, of the words of a beautiful hymn that came to mind as I was planning this communion prayer. One section begins with Jesus in the garden not long before he went to die for us. And the lyrics say, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. What love you have for us, precious Lord. You gave your own life to make that love known. It was God's plan, and you obeyed. How can we ever thank you enough for that gift, the gift that provides us with forgiveness of sin and freedom from death? As we take the bread and cup today, please fill us with your Holy Spirit that he may teach us all that we need to follow Jesus and that he will give us the courage to share the gifts he has given us with the world. In the name of our Lord, amen. And when he was seated at the table with his friends, and after they had finished their meal, Jesus picked up a loaf of bread and he held it out to them. He blessed it. He broke it. And he said to them this, This is my body broken for you. As often as you sit at this table and eat this bread, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he poured out another cup, and he held it out to them, saying, This, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you sit at this table and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, there is no barrier here. There is always plenty of room. Come, come and eat. Every week, we extend a hand, a welcome, an invitation. This is the body of Christ, and you are welcome. No matter your creed, your color, your size, 
whatever it is that makes you you, you deserve to be part of, a bo of the body of Christ, and we welcome you. If you'd like to talk more about that, feel free to make an appointment with me or to talk with any one of our elders. And now our closing hymn, if you will stand as you are able, our closing hymn is Abide With Me. Now and always. Amen. Amen.